Oh, this is cool. The simulation behind me is actually called Earth Civilization, which is pretty appropriate in regards to what we're going to be discussing. But first, story time. So back in college, when I was exploring various topics and various ideas, I was actually super obsessed with Geiger counters. I was trying to use them on pretty much everything, trying to see what was the most radioactive thing around me, and I was also trying to figure out how exactly they worked. I even basically tried to build one. It wasn't very easy, I never succeeded. But in the process I discovered some really intriguing things. First, the average background radiation on the planet actually varies quite a lot depending on where you are and depending on what, for example, things are made out of. For example, when I was in one of the university buildings, one of the older buildings, because of the material it was made from, specifically the rocks it was made from, the radiation here was slightly higher than outside or in other buildings. Which to my young mind was kind of mind-blowing, but the actual levels were still quite manageable and totally safe. These levels did actually go up quite dramatically when I measured all of this on the airplane. Here we're talking about levels that were like 50 to even 100 times higher than normal radiation on the ground. I actually tried to recreate this experiment approximately like 7 to 8 years ago with an older video on the channel, but the main point for these early experiments for me was to actually try to figure out how exactly was the Geiger counter doing all of this. And this led me to a discovery of a concept known as low background steel. Basically steel produced before the 1950s that turns out has an extremely low background radiation compared to modern steel that does actually have some radioactive particles in it. And turns out all of this was the result of nuclear testing in the 50s. Because of the variety of nuclear tests conducted in the 50s and the 60s, the total amount of various radioactive particles in the air increased quite dramatically, with the levels peaking in 1963 reaching the levels of about 0.11 millisievere per year, or about 5% of natural dose of about 2.4 millisievere. Which basically means that in the 60s, people were receiving approximately 5% more natural radiation than we did 10 years prior. Although because of the nuclear test ban, these levels have actually dropped quite dramatically, and the levels are now closer to about 0.005 millisievere, roughly around 500 times lower than the natural levels. But because of this, all of the steel produced after 1950s contains a relatively large amount of radioactive elements that prevent the steel from being used in certain industries. For example, industries involving very, very accurate detectors, such as Geiger counters. And so Geiger counters today cannot use steel produced after 1950s. And so instead, a lot of these devices and a lot of these instruments would often use steel that was actually scrapped from various sunk battleships often bought from places like Southeast Asia, where there were quite a lot of wrecks containing a lot of steel, which would then be used in production of extremely sensitive instruments, including instruments used in various medical industries. And so what exactly is the point here? Well, the point here is that pretty much anywhere you go on the planet now, there are going to be these signs of radioactive elements, such as cobalt-60, or in some cases even plutonium, which are entirely human-made, and which are sort of creating a visible sign of modern human activity on the entire planet, which in some sense can also be used as a definition of a new age, the so-called anthropogenic age, a new geological epoch defined entirely by significant human impact on both Earth's geology, various ecosystems, Earth's climate, and to some extent even rotation of Earth's axes. The age that seems to have begun right after the Second World War and the period when the socioeconomic status on the planet led to dramatic changes of pretty much everything, but also the age that seems to be clearly visible in these sediments around the planet, which officially makes this a new geological age, the age that we now refer to as Anthropocene. And in 2023, the scientists have now officially defined this age through a specific geographic location, and it just so happens to be in Canada. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. And it's basically a lake, so let's just go check it out really quickly. It's a lake not so far away from Toronto, and it's not a particularly large lake, it's also not particularly special, except that it's a lake located inside the conservation area, entirely protected from industrial activity, and also just so happens to be on the native land as well, which basically means that it's going to be protected for a very, very long time. You're not really allowed to do anything here. But more importantly, a lot of recent studies by using some of the sediments and samples from this lake definitively established that the sediment from the bottom of the lake seem to record precise data about human activity ever since the beginning of the Anthropocene age, with the sediments showing spikes in plutonium-239 and cobalt-60 all a result of human activity. 
But this wasn't the only site proposed by scientists. For example, the Bapu Bay in Japan was also one of the proposed locations. But the main problem here is that, well, it's not really as protected, and more importantly, unlike a lake where the sediments can stay completely undisturbed for thousands of years, this location has a lot of human activity nearby, and so in some sense it's a little bit more contaminated. And so Crawford Lake it is. So basically this is now the definition of the age of humans, the Anthropocene age. To some extent you can almost say it starts here. Or to be more exact, it contains the specific signs that the age of humans seems to be real. Although here I guess it's probably kind of important to understand what we mean by the age of humans compared to previous ages. In essence this is what we refer to as geologic clock. The clock that's divided into various periods, with each of them separated by major events. For example if you look right here, 66 million years ago, that's of course the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. And so in this case we're now in the so-called Cenozoic era. But this era can then be subdivided into three smaller periods, with the current period known as Quaternary. The period that started approximately 2.6 million years ago, when Earth cooled down just enough to suddenly start having periods of glaciation. Here we're talking about various ice ages. And the last glaciation period, or the last ice age, ended approximately 12,000 years ago, which was the beginning of the new epoch known as Holocene. And even though humans did exist before that, and were even most likely affecting the planet to some extent even before that, it was really during the Holocene that the humanity started to evolve so quickly that the effects became very pronounced. But now the modern suggestion is that, well, maybe there are actually three different epochs, and we might have just entered that third one. So Holocene was the second epoch, and the new one that the scientists want to propose is going to be called Anthropocene. A completely new epoch where the human effects become so dramatic that they actually start changing the planet even more. But obviously not everyone agrees with this, and there's actually even a question of do we need this new epoch? As I mentioned, during the Holocene, humans were already changing the planet enough to have at least some pronounced effects. And so what exactly is this Anthropocene epoch, and how would you even define this? Well, at least for now there seem to be five specific factors. First impact is the change in biodiversity in various regions. Here's actually a map showing us biodiversity of various land animals across the planet, and pretty much most of the locations here have dramatically decreased in total biodiversity. Here's another really intriguing map showing us how we changed various forests on the planet, which is directly correlated with biodiversity as well. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that we're causing an extinction event, but the recent study from 2023 established that 48% of approximately 70,000 different species have already experienced a major decline in numbers because of human activity, with only 3% of species increasing in numbers. Many of these are farm animals, but some of these have increased in numbers for a different reason we're going to discuss very soon. Then there is obviously the one that we've heard about from everywhere, the climate change, which here doesn't just mean CO2, but it also includes a lot of other gases, including things like methane or things like CFCs that often produce multiple effects including decreasing the ozone layers, yet also serving as a greenhouse gas in upper altitudes. Although when it comes to atmospheric changes, and not necessarily the climate change as a whole, this is still all ridiculously complex and is still very very difficult to predict or to analyze. But the correlations so far do suggest that the levels are increasing, slowly changing the conditions on the planet. But this one is of course not a surprise, we've heard this many times. What may be a surprise though, is also the change in geomorphology. Basically the humans, because of various types of activity, including changing waterways, have actually shifted the Earth's axis just a little bit. This was recently confirmed by at least one paper you can find in a description, but this is just one of many effects, in terms of geomorphology, that humans have changed in the last few decades. And so basically because of various types of landscaping, and even various types of mining, we've now affected the planet in terms of the actual shape and even distribution of gravity. The fourth one is of course the physical sign from various radioactive elements, specifically elements now circulating in the air, with at least 4 tons of plutonium produced during the atomic test era, and even more produced by various types of factories producing nuclear weapons. All of this detectable pretty much everywhere on the planet, and potentially even inside our bodies, possibly not doing anything good. Although here the levels are actually quite low, so it's not really something you should be worrying about. But then the last, and I guess the most surprising, is actually in regards to cities. The urban environment has dramatically changed the way life evolves on the planet. Surprisingly there are several species of animals and even plants that have now started changing genetically 
in order to adapt to cities with these new genes than making it outside of the cities and spreading across the planet. Or in other words, modern cities are now changing the evolution on the planet and are to some extent accelerating evolutionary processes by changing various ecological interactions between animal life and plants. This was actually only discovered less than a decade ago, and quite a few studies have now confirmed this, which basically means that human activity directly evolved life. And which also means that in the next 100 to 200 years, there's going to be a completely new selection of genes in various common species that possibly did not exist or was not important previously. And because this is all kind of more or less recent, we don't even know exactly what effects this is going to have long term. Nevertheless, urban environment seems to be now a primary driver of evolution on the planet. And that's actually kind of mind-blowing. Not radiation from human activity, not even humans themselves, the urban environment. That's what drives evolution on the planet. With all of this once again mostly starting approximately seven decades ago. And that's of course when the cities became more prominent, with most people moving from rural to urban environments. And so to some extent, I guess Anthropocene is an actual new epoch after all. It's not just a continuation of Holocene, it seems to be its own new thing. And though some scientists have actually proposed this to be just some kind of a spike in the geological data, because of all of these other effects, including evolution on the planet, the changes in biodiversity, and of course the changes in atmospheric and climatic conditions, all of this as a whole does suggest that Anthropocene might have started, and we're now officially changing the planet way more than before. Now, it doesn't mean that this is a bad thing, and I'm not trying to give you a kind of a doom and gloom message here, I'm just giving you the obvious facts. We're doing this, it's kind of hard to deny it, it's also extremely unlikely we're going to stop or going to change anything, so instead I think it's about time we started to think about where all of this is headed and how we're going to adapt. But that we're going to discuss in some of the future videos. Anyway, thank you for watching, we're definitely going to be coming back and discussing some of these ideas in a little bit more detail in some of the future videos, but until then, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.